Matt Smethers, my friend, good to see you. Uh, we've known each other since your freshman year of college when you were at JMU, and you were involved in the crew movement there when I was on staff there. Uh, talk to me about what your experiences were like as a student involved in crew, kind of where you were at in your relationship with God and how it's sent you on your trajectory for the rest of your life up until uh, your most current job and what you're doing right now with the Gospel Coalition. Yeah, well, when I arrived on campus as a freshman at JMU, I understood myself to be a Christian. I, I, I think I was a Christian and I intended to, to live as a Christian, but I didn't completely understand what that looked like. Um, I had a difficult roommate situation my freshman year, which the Lord ended up really using to drive me to Scripture in a way that I, I had never been driven there before. Uh, and I got involved uh, with crew and started to learn how to share the importance of sharing my faith and how to share my faith. Um, I think before college, I would have been able to um, definitely identify the gospel, mm -hmm. but I, I wasn't able to explain it or articulate it um, until I got involved with crew and, and learned not only how, but also learned the joy, the exhilaration of getting to, to tell others about Jesus. Yeah. I, uh, loved getting to know you and seeing kind of your journey. I think it was your junior year that you became the MC. Yep. Yeah. So uh, me running the weekly meetings and you being the MC there. A lot uh, of fun. Lots of fun. Enjoying that time. What was probably one of your favorite times uh, in crew and maybe that involved you being an MC or the large group meeting that happened every Thursday night? But what was uh, maybe a couple of your favorite things being a student involved in crew? Yeah, well, uh, getting to be a part of a very vibrant and thriving movement at the time. There, there were a Pretty lot big. of people at our large group meetings, and, and so there was just a lot of energy and excitement in the room. Yeah. And so as an MC, that's a, that's a dream come true, right? You can just kind of ride the, ride the wave of people's enthusiasm. And I think that uh, my favorite part of being the MC. So, you know, it would always start out with about five minutes of, uh, you know, B level stand up comedy. <laughs> all right, that's all, yeah. you know, you get what you pay for. <laughs> uh, but my favorite part was when I got to explain what crew is all about. Right, yeah. And you had always taught me, you know, Matt, assume that you're, don't assume knowledge on the part of your audience. Don't assume that they know spiritual terminology, Christianese. Uh, you know, you always would say, put the cookies on the bottom shelf. So that's what I tried to do. And I think I grew to do that better and better. And so I enjoyed artic trying to articulate the gospel in a fresh and uh, kind of maybe even sometimes counterintuitive way mm -hmm. uh, for people uh, every, every Thursday night. Yeah. And you went on a summer mission after your junior year or after, after my sophomore year. your sophomore year okay and so that was was that the first time you had actually been overseas like at all it was yeah i mean i i can remember uh that spring it's probably actually february or march uh a, a, a girl named april who was on staff came up and challenged me to consider going on this summer mission that summer mm -hmm. and she, you know she uh, said in a very crew-like way, I challenge you to pray about thinking about praying about going to this. And of course, <laughs> yeah. I can't say no. I mean, right. you can't say you're not going to pray about something. Mm -hmm. So I prayed about it. And before I knew it, I was, you know, 20,000 right feet in the air over the Pacific Ocean. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it was a wonderful experience. Yeah, that was influential in your life in a number of ways, right? It gave you a heart for those people. And then what did it lead to after your graduation? It led to going on a stint there for two years. Okay. So got to actually go back to the same city in East Asia and do campus ministry. So just sharing my faith and discipling uh, guys and, and got to just see the Lord work in, in some really ex exciting ways among people who had never heard uh, the gospel before. Some of whom had never heard the name of Jesus. And even if they had, had no clue who he was. Like one guy told me that I said, who? Do you know who Jesus is? Have you heard of Jesus? And he said, yes, he is an American God. <laughs> um, well, you obviously have uh, been in ministry for a very long time since your graduation. You did uh, a two-year trip with crew. And then talk about your experiences after that and, and who you work for now, what that, what that kind of looks like at the Gospel Coalition. Yeah, so those two years with, uh, with crew in East Asia were very formative. And uh, it was over there where I, I sensed 
kind of a call to pastoral ministry, to, to preaching uh, God's Word on, on a weekly basis. And so I thought, well, I probably should go to seminary. So I came back to the States and did a pastoral intern program in Washington, D.C., and then went to um, seminary in Louisville, Kentucky, and have been serving as a, a lay pastor in a church for the past few years. And I work full-time for a Christian organization called the Gospel Coalition. Mm-hmm. Now, what do what does the Gospel Coalition do um, as a ministry? Yeah, so the Gospel Coalition was founded 10 or 11 years ago uh, by two guys, Tim Keller, a pastor in New York City, and Don Carson, a uh, professor in Illinois. Mm-hmm. And they were kind of looking out at the the, the evangelical world, the, the, the world of Christianity, at least in America, mm-hmm. and wanting... Um, to be prophetic from the center, meaning not to slide into liberalism on the left or fundamentalism on the right, but to keep the main thing, the main thing, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so when people ask me what TGC, the Gospel Coalition is, I sometimes speak of three C's. Uh, There's the council, there's the content, and there are the conferences. I think about 10 years ago, if you were to ask someone, or even five years ago, what is TGC, they would probably say, oh, it's a conference, Mm -hmm. and you also have a website. I think now people would say, oh, it's a website. Mm -hmm. Um, It's a a resource database with articles, and you also do events. So we do all kinds of things to try to equip and resource Christians, local churches, to bring grace and truth to this age. Yeah, and I know even for me personally, it's been a um, phenomenal resource in my life because you can go there to find... Uh, subjects that are difficult to talk about, uh, things that where you have significant questions or even doubts about Scripture, and it can point you in a lot of different directions because you have a lot of minds right. uh, and good teachers yeah. as a part of it that gives great content. Well, so much of what we do is with a view to the kind of questions college students are facing on campus. Yeah. So the the kind of videos and interviews and articles and even events that we're uh, putting out have to do with some of the big questions of of our day. And so we, we hope that it's helpful. And we've been encouraged to see that it has been helpful to a lot of college students. Yeah, sure. What is your specific role at the Gospel Coalition? I'm the managing editor, which just means I, I oversee the daily content production, everything we publish on the website. On the web. Okay. Yeah, great. Um, well, obviously, you've learned a lot about Scripture over your time, not only uh, as a student involved, but then going on stint and being at seminary and being part of the Gospel Coalition. Uh, we want to talk about your uh, your insight into approaching the Bible the correct way. Mm-hmm. Um, so can you share a little bit about your own journey in relationship to the Bible? Yeah, and when you say approaching the Bible, I, th- I kind of think of that a little bit differently than reading or studying or interpreting the Bible. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, when it comes to approaching the Bible, I'm thinking more of, of kind of the, the state or the posture of my heart before I even open up the book. Okay. Um, when I, as I mentioned earlier, when I when I came to college, I I knew kind of what the Bible said, but I don't think I really knew what it meant, mm-hmm. and I had never walked through uh, very difficult times at that point in my life, relatively speaking. And yeah. so it was through some difficult experiences my freshman year that I developed a desperation for God's word for the first time in my life, mm-hmm. and that kind of set me on a trajectory to just want to dive deeper into God's Word in order to get to know the author. Yeah. Why is it important to consider your heart posture as you approach the Bible? Obviously, you know, from your personal experiences, why is it important for others to do that as well? Well, because the Bible is not like a textbook right. in, in your class. Yeah. The, the Bible is, is a living library of books, all kinds of genres. And the most important reason is because it's, a, it's where we engage relationally with our Creator. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so there is something special going on where he is speaking to us through his word, and then we respond back and speak to him through prayer. So it's the, it's the opportunity to, to interact and engage with the one who made us. Right. That's beautiful. Um, so you, you talk about seven specific ways to approach that. Why don't you kind of list those for us to start? Yeah. Well, uh, I think in order to approach the, the Bible rightly the way that God would want, we need to first and foremost approach it humbly. Okay. Uh, we, we need to approach it desperately, as, as I was uh, mentioning. We, we need to approach it studiously, uh, you know, wanting to be um, 
uh, accurate in the way that we think about who God is in mm -hmm. order to honor Him. We, we want to approach it obediently, right? Uh, and we want to approach it joyfully and also expectantly, expecting God uh, to, to accomplish things in us. And then last but not least is frequently, yeah. right? It, it's much better to eat, um, you know, a, a medium-sized meal every day than to just binge on a buffet once a week. You're going to starve to death if that's all you do. Yeah. Why don't we kind of go through those one by one? So we want to start with, I'm looking at your list of what you've come up with. Start with humbly. Why don't we talk about that for a minute? Yeah, first and foremost, I think we need to acknowledge the fact that God didn't owe us the Bible. That The fact that the creator of the universe has chosen to say anything to us, the fact that, that God is a talker, a communicator yeah. is incredible. And it would be incredible enough just if we were creatures, but we're not just creatures, we're also rebels, right? We, we've also turned away from him and built our lives around other things. So the fact that he would speak even to us um, in our rebellion and give us a way to know him and to please him and to find life and joy ourselves should humble us. Yeah. I've heard a great definition of the word humble is knowing your place. And this kind of seems what you're talking about. Just know your place as you approach scripture. Yeah, that's great. Uh, so number two, desperately, approaching it desperately. What does that mean? That means that we come to the Bible with a recognition that without it, we will starve. Uh, Jesus in the wilderness temptation said, uh, to the devil, he said, he quoted Deuteronomy that man does not live by bread alone, but from every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Mm -hmm. Jeremiah chapter 15 talks about, uh, the prophet says, when your words came, I ate them and they were my joy and delight. Mm -hmm. So understanding that, that we are desperate for God, we need to hear from him in order to uh, survive, in order to, to, to live fruitful Christian lives. Yeah, and that's something that you, initially didn't grasp as a student that, that became more exactly. apparent to you over yeah, time. Yeah, over time. Okay. So humbly, desperately, studiously, what does that mean? Well, uh, there's a little verse that I noticed in college, uh, probably my junior year. Uh, it's one of those that's easy to miss, but Psalm 111, 2 says, Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. That's not the word I would have expected. I would have maybe expected the word celebrated by mm -hmm. all who delight in them, right? Acknowledged. But no, it, it says studied. And then, of course, in, in uh, the book of Acts, we read about the, the Bereans, the people in Berea who were commended because when they heard Paul's uh, gospel preaching, they checked it against the Old Testament scriptures. It says that they examined the things Paul was saying against the scriptures to see if they were so. Mm -hmm. So God is honored when we approach his word thoughtfully. We're, he wants us to love him, uh, not just with our hearts and souls, but also with our minds. And um, the ultimate reason is, is not just that we'll f you know, feel like we, we know everything, because we don't. Mm -hmm. and, and if you start to feel like that, that's dangerous. But it's so that we can know him. When I was a kid, you know this about me, um, I was obsessed with Michael Jordan. Mm -hmm. I studied Michael Jordan's statistics. Yeah. I studied them, but why? Is it just because I had this weird love for statistics and numbers? No, I actually wasn't much of a math guy. I studied Michael Jordan's statistics because I loved Michael Jordan. Mm -hmm. And so we study God's word precisely because we want to know and love him. Yeah, that's great. Um, fourth, uh, obediently approaching scripture with a heart of obedience. Talk about that for a sec. Well, Jesus is very clear that, that many people uh, will, on the last day, say, Lord, Lord, didn't I do all these things in your name? Wasn't I uh, involved in crew? Wasn't I uh, in a Bible study? Didn't I go to church? Didn't I get baptized? And, and he will say, depart from me. I never knew you. And the reason in the context of that passage that he gives is that these were people who were hypocrites. Their lives didn't match their words. And so it's very easy to, you know, talk the talk and uh, to be able to, to say the right things, but God is interested in obedience. And Shelby, one thing that's that's interesting about obedience is that even as a dad with, with young kids, I'm not always pleased when my kids obey me. It's not just them obeying me that I want. I want them to obey me with a happy heart, right? Yeah. right? If, they, if they begrudgingly obey me, 
you know, they are, are, there's going to be a consequence because they did it with a fussy heart. We talk about that. And so in the same way, God wants us to obey him, not just because, you know, we have to, but he wants us to obey him because we trust him that he has, he has given us uh, moral guidance for our good. He's designed us to find life and joy by following and trusting him. Yeah. Being a parent teaches you a lot about your own heart and uh, does, how, yes. how awful we are, basically. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so obediently, uh, fifth is joyfully. I want to approach the scriptures with joy. Yeah, so similar to what I was just saying, we, we uh, Jesus, Jesus talked about uh, providing joy and joy to the full. And so if we are encountering God on the pages of the Bible and we're leaving unaffected, unmoved, joyless, then there's something wrong. Now, we are all going to go through dry times spiritually, difficult times spiritually, but we should be pursuing the kind of joy that um, is waiting for us and available for us in God's Word. Yeah. I'm glad you added that caveat because there are seasons when you can Very read it and so. it feels hard, but it, that's kind of the overall uh, connection that you have to scriptures without joy, then there's, there's definitely something wrong. You want to check that. Yeah. It's great. Um, okay, sixth, expectantly. I think this is a really important one and something that uh, is, is not often talked about. And this is just you come to the Word of God with the expectation that, hey, this is an omnipotent book. This book is all-powerful because its author is all-powerful. And you better be careful because he might change your life. <laughs> uh, it is through the Word, through hearing the Word, that we are born again, that we, we become Christians in the first place. And it is through the word that we grow as Christians. Jesus prayed in John chapter 17, Father, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Mm -hmm. In other words, sanctify them, change them, grow them, make them more like me through their Bibles. And so we should come with the expectation that the, that the, the, the God of the universe, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who loves us, wants to um, not just give us information, but wants to accomplish transformation in our hearts. Yeah. So we, we see the, f the first six that you've talked about, but we want to approach those first six ones via the seventh one, which is frequently. Exactly. And I, I think that as you grow as a Christian, this is one that, that um, can be easily lost. Mm -hmm. uh, again, when you, there's a connection between the desperately and the frequently. Yeah. When you don't feel desperate for God's Word, you're not going to um, naturally frequently come to it. But that's, again, why it's important, like we were talking about, to realize that even when you don't feel like reading the Word, that's the time when you most need to read the Word. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes it's going to feel like a duty. It's going to be a discipline. But let's be honest, Shelby, all the, all the greatest things in our lives have come through hardship. And so we shouldn't expect it to be any any different, right? Um, and it's going to be not on the sunniest days of your life, but it's going to be in the, some of the darkest days of your life, some of the days where you feel numb, you feel dry, you feel disconnected from God, but you still open up His Word expectantly and, and frequently. Those are going to be the times where He shows up and ministers to you. Yeah, that makes sense. What, what do you think is... Uh, the hardest one for you now, and maybe the one that was hardest for you as a student as well? As a student, I think approaching the Bible, I think I would have scoffed maybe at approaching the Bible studiously okay. because I would have assumed, hey, it, it's supposed to be this like relational yeah, changing thing, your heart, yeah. changing my heart. Why, you know, I, I'm not in class right now. Um, so I think it, it took me a little while to develop an understanding of the importance of theology and thinking rightly about God. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it makes sense though. If, if, if I was gushing to you about my wife, just, just honoring the, the heck out of her saying, you know, she, is, uh, she has gorgeous red hair and she's from Oregon and she hates chocolate. <laughs> Would that honor my chocolate loving brunette who hails from Virginia? <laughs> no, because right. it's, it's not describing her accurately. And so right. we can, we can, mean to glorify and honor God, but if, if we're not worshiping Him for who He actually has revealed Himself to be in the Bible, then it doesn't honor Him. Now, I think the biggest struggle I encounter is probably reading it desperately. Desperately. There's, there's that danger of becoming a professional Christian, someone who feels like, 
you know, I, I know this, um, and not coming hungry and, and, and feeling like I need to hear from you, God, today, or I'm going to wither spiritually. Mm-hmm. Where do you think students today, where, where do you think they kind of miss the mark when it comes to approaching Scripture, if you were to make a guess? Or maybe not a guess, but an educated guess. An educated guess. Yeah. Uh, I think I would, I would probably say two things. First, I would say I think a lot of students don't read the Bible uh, with a view to Jesus Christ. So some passages in the Bible are obviously about Jesus, right? right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are giving us biographies of Jesus. Right. But what I didn't really understand in college very well, and what I think a lot of people don't realize today, is that the entire Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, is about Jesus. The, the, the Old Testament, it, you know, it's been said that the Old Testament is anticipation, mm-hmm. the Gospels are manifestation, Acts is proclamation, the letters or the epistles are explanation, and then Revelation is consummation, but it's all about Jesus. I think it's easy to kind of assume that the Bible is a uh, a bunch of disconnected, uh, morally inspiring stories, Daniel in the lion's den, David and Goliath. Mm-hmm. And rather than, instead of just seeing Bible stories, learning the story of the Bible, the overarching right. narrative that centers on Jesus. That points to him, yeah. So what would you hope that the students would experience if they were to approach the Bible in, in a correct way? I'd, ho- I'd hope they would experience, first and foremost, meeting with God. The, the, the unique thing about the Bible story, is that it's the only story in the universe where the central character loves us back. Mm -hmm. And so if they want to not only honor the one who made them, but also experience the kind of joy and life and satisfaction that they were made for, Mm -hmm. then they have to open his word and hear from him. Any good relationship, any healthy friendship is based on communication and listening. And so, um, I would hope that students would experience God in a new way, and I would hope that they would be inspired to live countercultural lives. It's difficult to be a Christian, and yet the Bible makes it clear that um, obedience leads to joy. Mm -hmm. That's counterintuitive, but it's true. Obedience leads to joy. Yeah, Yeah, I don't think many Christians believe that, let alone experience that, because they don't practice it. So if there's someone maybe who has been in the Bible for many years, maybe they've been a Christian since they were really young, which approach of the seven do you think that they should uh, focus on or maybe um, lean into a little bit more than they might be doing currently? I think reading it obediently is, is one where, you know, It's easy to have a lot of head knowledge and to know what the Bible says, but hey, it was the Bible experts. It was the religious establishment of the day that murdered the Son of God. Um, And the Bible itself says that even the demons believe. Mm -hmm. Um, So a demon would do great in seminary. You know, the devil himself could could, um, ace a theology exam, but it's important for all of us, you know, beginning with me, as we read the Bible thinking, okay, what does God intend for me to do with this today in my life. Yeah, that's um, interesting to think about. We don't often think about that, that the, the Satan could ace a thing. Yeah, that's, uh, it's profound and it's also kind of scary because yeah. a, a lot of people um, kind of prop themselves up against a lot of knowledge when right. it comes to theology. Right. And so, that would be the danger. You know, I said one of the ways we approach the Bible is studiously, uh-huh. but anything can be you know, misused or taken too, too far. And yeah. if that's that becomes all your Bible reading is about, well, then you've you've forsake you you've lost the heart of it all. Yeah. So if, if someone has never really read the Bible, they're not familiar with the scriptures. They might be new to the faith, or might be even like looking toward Christianity because it's it's it's, a, it's appealing. Yeah. Um, where would you suggest that they actually start when it comes to? Uh, leaning into the Bible and how how would they begin this whole journey? I would suggest one of the four Gospels, uh, the Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. I could kind of make a case for for each one because each is a kind of a unique vantage point onto the life of Jesus. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think the best thing you can do if you're wanting to uh, if if you're wanting to ju- just explore the Bible for the first time is to explore the person of Jesus Christ encounter Jesus on the pages of scripture, see what he was like, see how he, you know, there's no other person you've met and there's no other person in human history 
who um, was so strong and yet so humble mm-hmm. and combined all of these um, seemingly polar opposite attributes and most of all was sinless. He never once uh, built his life around things other than God. Mm-hmm. He always pleased his father. He prayed a lot of prayers, but he never had to co- pray a prayer of confession. He never had to confess sin. He, he was the person I was meant to be, the person I, was, uh, I, um, I have failed to be. And yet, because of his grace and the gospel which we encounter in the Bible, I can uh, get to know him and be treated as if I've lived his life. If, if you had to add one more thing as you think about our approach to Scripture, what would any last thoughts be? Well, I didn't include this. This could have been number eight, but it almost uh, would, I think, trivi- trivialize it because it's really the thing that should frame all seven of these, and that's that we should approach our Bibles prayerfully. We, we should approach our Bibles with a heart that's asking God, begging God to reveal Himself to us, to convict us of areas where we're um, not pleasing Him, uh, to encourage us in areas where we might feel uh, despondent. You know, there, there was one, one old preacher who said that the Bible comforts the afflicted and it afflicts the comfortable. And that is why it, it's unlike any other book you will ever encounter. It's not a book that, um, that any human beings uh, could have just created out of thin air because it uh, it constantly surprises us. Even me, I've been a Christian, been walking with God, been reading the Bible for years, and it still surprises me, um, sometimes in painful ways, yeah. but always in good ways. Yeah. Thanks so much for being with us. Yeah. Thanks, um, Shelby. You know, the content was, was really amazing and convicting. So thanks, Matt. Thanks.